science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it, and eventually, if there's an enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. For newcomers and old timers alike, the Chloe Sanctuary hopes to give you insight into the health and happiness of your companion parrots. We hope to help you build happy homes using reliable and proven tools. The best homes are built on a rock solid foundation. And the best foundation for a happy home is the bedrock of science. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, the scientists who have worked long and diligently to understand our companions, we can reach new heights of understanding. And understanding is the key to success. What does avian veterinary medicine have to tell us about our feathered friends? How can we prevent illness, see the signs of disease before it's too late, and care for our birds through ill health? What light does behavioral science shed on their nature, needs, and hopes? How can the tools of behavior shaping make our homes happier for us and our companions? How can we deal with biting, screaming, or other misbehavior? What is it like to live among parrots, let them roam around about you and share a life with them? How much freedom do you give them? What happens if you form a bond of trust with them? Watch and see what understanding their true nature can do for you. Come with us on a journey as we do more than examine a parrot's world. We live in it. Make some popcorn and bring in a few wood blocks. Let everyone have something to chew and a comfortable place to perch. Cockatoot is a presentation of the Chloe Sanctuary for Parrots and Cockatoos, a nonprofit charity dedicated to the empowerment of captive parrots and public awareness. Cockatoos with attitude. Cockatoot. I want to encourage everyone to become a patron and go out to patreon.com forward slash Chloe Sanctuary. And you can give as little as a dollar an episode, just a dollar an episode to help us do this. It takes about 30 hours to do one video, and we would appreciate your help. And thank you so much to all of our patrons who are helping us now. You guys are wonderful. And welcome to Cockatoo, Cockatoos with Attitude, episode 26, What If? Hi, Cecil. And today with us, we have Cecil sitting up here on my shoulder, and Babalu down here playing with wood, and Roman Bird being Roman Bird. Hi, Roman. Yes, he was our little scaredy, scaredy cat when we first got him. And he's still a little nervous, aren't you? You'd rather be all alone. And we have Peaches and Cause, which are starting, they're starting to get along. Yes, Peaches. Oh, well, I know you want her out of there, but... Simone, she's not going to be in that cage for too long, but she'll be in there for just a little while. And then we have Chloe, who's hiding on top of the rail up there. That seems to be her spot whenever we're doing a video. Right, Chloe? Yeah, it's kind of hard to video. I don't have a camera running in that direction, silly. And then we have Snowball over here. Salamander. Who, no, there's no movie on right now. That's his put a movie on routine. He gets across that little bar there and he wants to watch a movie. He'll walk back and forth looking at the blank screen. It's pretty obvious what he wants when he does that. Isn't it, Sal? No movie right now, sweetie. And sugar, sugar bird. What are you doing up there? So today we're going to talk about what if. And basically there are a lot of different things that can happen in your life from, the, from very basic things that need to be taken care of that day to things that need to be taken care of over a, a period of time, as in over a week or a few days. 
And those emergencies that crop up that require that you have everything ready to go and, and a place to go to so that you can get away and have everybody safe. So, and we've been through a fire, so we can tell you a little bit about preparation. So let's talk about emergencies first and you know, the, the critical things because most people will tend to watch a video for the first 10 or 15 minutes and then they don't always finish, so I think it's important to get the uh, emergencies out for everybody first. Um, we'll talk about the fire we had in 2010. Um, believe it or not, this organization was working out of an apartment for a while and we had six birds at the time and they all had some pretty big cages and their the whole living room was just stuffed full of cages and I was in the kitchen working and I smelled something funny um, just, a little, just a little bit of smoke and you get it you get attuned to that kind of thing when you're around birds because they can't take you know, odors in the air at all so I looked up towards the ceiling in the kitchen and I saw a little bit of smoke just trailing along the kitchen ceiling. So I ran and grabbed a, a couple of, I had three small carriers and six birds. Now this is the critical thing. Your birds have to be comfortable enough with you so that if you're in an emergency situation, you can just grab them and they won't fight you and you can put them in a small cage. So I reached out and grabbed each bird and shoved him into one of the three cages. So there were two in each cage. Are you sure about that, Peaches? Are you? Positive? So got him in the cages. And as I was going out the door, just sitting the cages outside the door, with the last cage, Hey, Chaz, calm down, baby. What's the matter? What's the matter? The wall, as I was going out, just exploded in flame. And uh, fortunately, they didn't get any exposure to smoke because there really wasn't anything other than a little bit of smoke in the room when that wall went up. But um, apparently it was mice eating the wires in the walls that caused the problem. So I get the birds down and I got them into my, at the time I had a car, now we have a truck, and that was another story, but um, we, had a, we had a car, so I loaded them in the car, and uh, it was a cool day, and the car was in shade, so I just buttoned it up and went over to look at what was happening. By then the fire trucks showed up, and I'm standing down there looking perfectly calm. Like, it, like there was no big problem at all, and uh, in fact, it, I guess I looked so calm that they thought maybe I had started the fire. When they found out I did not have insurance, then they dropped that whole thing and just kind of went on and did the rest of their work. It only took them about, well, 10 minutes to get the fire completely out, then they hung around for another 15, just making sure that all the, the last bits of any chance for a flame were gone. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to uh, have the Red Cross come out. They could give me a little cash. And, you know, the thing is, you don't really plan, most people don't, they don't plan to have a little extra cash in their pocket for an emergency like that or some way to grab a hold of it. Um, and at the time, we had some small cages, and you know, we'll carry cages, but we didn't have extras. And all the cages in the building were destroyed. So... Well, not fully destroyed. We were able to, uh, um, Dan and Deb, who are um, members of the sanctuary, and yeah, Deb is uh, actually the president of the board. At the time, um, they convinced me that we should take the parts of the cages out of there, which we did, and then they had them resurfaced. So they, they had the coating put back on in Chloe's cage and Lorelei's cage. And so we got those two cages back. But when you have a lot of birds, you don't think about it. What happens if you lose all those cages? What are you going to do? Well, fortunately, we had somebody else on the board at the time, Melissa, who she brought us cages. Within an hour and a half, we had cages. And uh, we, the place I was living at, they found a temporary place for us to be that night. And, and uh, 
We ended up having to move out of there, though. Uh, they just didn't like the fact we had so many birds. And uh, that's how we ended up in, in our new place, which is on an acre. And so what we hadn't thought about is what do you do in a fire? If you are enjoying our videos, we hope that you can find it in your heart to support our work. It costs between $25,000 to $30,000 a year to care for our flock of heartbroken and abused birds. Most of our birds came with feather destructive disorder. Even a basic exam with blood work costs $300. Medical emergencies cost us thousands a year. We are a nonprofit, and donations are tax deductible to the full extent of the law. We need your support. Birds deserve a happy and healthy life. Become our patron at www.patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary to support us on a per video basis or donate at our webpage today. I mean, I had thought about getting them out the door, but I hadn't thought about the other things, like what about cages, if the cages are destroyed? Uh, where do you go if you don't have a place to live? So we're fortunate that they let us live there for a while before we moved on. Um, and then just having the, the extra cash on hand not having to go to the bank and, and you know, pick up money and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, when the Red Cross came, they gave they gave us about, I think it was $180, which was enough to buy some clothes, because the clothes were all gone. The computer was destroyed. Um, all of our records, which I felt that I had done a great job of backing up, were on external disks inside where the fire was. So, obviously, we lost all that. The only reason we didn't lose uh, my customer base, and because I do computer work, uh, which funds most of the sanctuary, um, the only reason we didn't lose that, and I didn't lose potentially a ton of business, is that I had an iPhone. And all that information was on my iPhone. <coughs> so I've become a great believer in Apple. You could call me an Apple evangelist. I really don't think too much of Windows. I wouldn't have, if I'd had everything on Windows, it would have been lost. Um, I now, of course, do back up. Another thing you need to do, uh, as well as you know, planning where you're going to go, if something happens, where can you and your birds go um, that'll be safe and uh, secure for them? Bob, uh, what are you doing? No, you're not going to go cause trouble. You can sit over here and play, okay? Let's sit over here and play. So you need to have some money set aside, uh, some credit too, because you don't know, you may end up having to buy everything all over again. I had to buy a new computer, I had to buy, um, fortunately I didn't have to buy too many cages because most of Why don't you come sit over here? Why don't you just come sit up here, because you're just having a day. Sit right there, it's all right, peaches, easy, easy, he's not going to hurt you. He's not, it's okay. It's all right, sweetie. It's all right. And you, what are you doing? Don't put your tail in her face, okay? She's not gonna like that much. She's not. No, she's not. Mm -mm. So you need a, a place to go. Well, you know, a lot of this you can get from the Red Cross. There's even an app for uh, Androids and for iPhones from the Red Cross that will it will help you uh, plan these things. Come here, Bob. Bobaloo. Come here, Bob. Come on, Bob. Come here. That's a good boy. Very good play. Good play. So you have to have routes, multiple routes. You might have an earthquake, you might have a fire. In some areas you may have flooding. 
Whatever the digital. <laughs> Well, you missed her, but you almost, you almost pooped on her, you silly bird. You did. What are you doing out there, Cos? Cos, you okay? Come on. Cos, it's all right, sweetheart. So you have to have routes depending on what the situation is. Such as with flooding or fire, you may not be able to go one particular way, so you need multiple exits from where you live. Uh, then you need to have some, like with birds, you should have an individual bag with their name on it that has stuff that they need. Um, you know, the basic things for emergencies. Um, and then you should have a medical bag too that has things like uh, super clot to stop bleeding and uh, if they're in a situation they're not used to, they may break a feather, and if it's a blood feather, you may need to pull it, so you'll need to have a pair of hemostats. And then uh, we'll try to put a list of the basic things that you need. Plus, we also have a... No, Bob, come here. You're not eating the wire off that. No, thank you. Bob, behave. Don't start this. Don't go after the speaker... Oh, the microphone, okay? So, um, we do have an episode on that does list the medical items, but we'll, we'll go ahead and see if we can put that on the show notes. <clears throat> so a bag for each of them that has food, that has uh, whatever specifics they need, if there's particular toys they like, uh, just to, so they won't be uh, getting nervous and upset when a move, with a move like that. Bob, you're not doing that. Over here. Um... <laughs> So you need the route, you need to check with the, uh, the Red Cross so that you have the exits, and then you need a place where you're going to go. Those things are all important in an emergency. And having gone through a fire and been in a situation where if I hadn't, we hadn't had the support that we had from Melissa and uh, where she brought five cages down so that we had, with one cage we could sort of salvage and the five she brought we had cages for all the birds. At the bare minimum you need carrying cages for every bird, and a credit card if you need to go out and buy more cages. You should have a good friend you can go to their home with, where you can take your birds, That's and, you know, and then on top of that, more than one is better. <clears throat> if you run into a situation where for some reason those people are out on vacation, the very week that you need to uh, move into their place for a while, it can be a problem. You need to back up whatever information you have about your birds. You may have health information. You may have uh, pictures of your birds, things that you're going to want, pictures of your family in general. Uh, you should back up to an online service such as Crash Plan. Um, there are a number of different services. Apple has such a service. Google has a service like that. If you use a service like Crash Plan, it's going to actually have. It'll actually back up your entire computer. So if you lose your computer, you can get a new one and just upload everything into it. Um, it's good to have a physical backup at your location, at your home or your office, but that can get destroyed as it did when we had the fire. So, Which of course in disasters, don't forget you need to have some clothes for yourself, something that you can just grab a bag and run out with, where you have clothes, you have you know at least a couple of changes of clothes and things like that. So, it's not much fun when you're in a disaster situation in the middle of an earthquake or, you know, some giant flood. They have to be digging around to try to find clothes to go out the door. Just have a bag with that stuff ready. Oh, communications, too. Um, Twitter's the best if you can still get communication uh, with your phone, because sometimes the cell towers go out. If the cell towers are out, then it's not going to be terribly helpful to, to you try to use Twitter to communicate using your phone. The next thing you can get, you can get these small handheld units that, um, that are ham radios. Now, you have to have a license to operate them, except in an emergency. So, if... Hi, Chloe! Hi, Chloe! <laughs> If you pick up $50 for one of these handheld radios, if you go to a, a local ham radio club for one of their meetings, usually they'll let non-members in, just ask them what the best radio is to buy, and 
you know, an inexpensive radio. Find out what channels or have them set it up for you so that if you have an emergency, you can get on the ham radio and ask for help. It is legal to use a ham radio, even if you don't have a license, in an emergency. But don't use it for any other purposes. If you try to just chat on one of those without a license, you're breaking federal laws. You don't want to do that. So, right, Bob? Right, Bob? Okay. Bob agrees. He does. Uh, in an emergency, you should also have someone to contact. So they know that if something happened in your area, they hear it on the news, uh, you will be contacting them to, to tell them their status. And also, there should be somebody who you have designated to check to see if you're okay in those circumstances. So, um, hmm, nice feather. That's Bob's. That's a Bob feather. You can tell because it's tapered at the end. <laughs> All right? Right, Cecil? You don't have any feathers like that. You don't either, do you, Roman? Mm, Roman bird? I love you, too. You're a good boy. So, there are other situations that pop up. But they don't have to be done necessarily that very day. A good example is, <clears throat> I was using air conditioners like this one. This air conditioner here in, in the other room had an air conditioner in there that was like this, which is a portable. Now, stop with the nipping. Come here. You don't need to be nippy. You don't need to be nippy. No, you don't. I know it's mating season, but you don't have to do that. But fortunately, they've come out with some smaller units that will fit in these tiny windows. These windows don't have much room, and I needed something that would go into 20 inches or less. Well, these new air conditioners are 19 and a half, so they fit. Uh-oh. Can't have Roman around my socks. He'll eat my feet. Won't you, Roman? I know you. Yeah, it's almost like the feet. No, you're not going to go down there and get my feet. No, I don't think so. You don't want to do that. Because you love me, don't you? I love you, Mom. Snowball, what are you doing? Chloe? Chloe? Chloe Bird? Chloe? Salamander, he's not going to hurt you. Sal. Sal. It's all right, Salamander. Aw, poor Sal. It's okay. It's okay, Sal. Bob, you behave. You're causing trouble. You're causing trouble. And you're trying to eat my head. <laughs> okay. It's a little difficult. Organizing everything when you're looking at a camera and you have to try to keep everybody in line It's really not that difficult for me when I don't have cameras in the room. Are you guys gonna do that again? You are Okay, so the issue with the, with there is that when you when you have a project like changing an air conditioner there's a lot of different considerations we have as bird keepers that, you know, sanctuaries, rescues, and people have birds at home that other people don't have. For example, I have an exposed hose over here, and I have to keep an eye on it. But in the other room, their playroom and night room, uh, I can't keep an eye on it. So what I had done was I built a box around it using plywood. So I had to, I had to rip all of that out and then put one up in, into, the, into the window, which I didn't have anybody to help me at the time, so I had to figure out a way to slide that in the window without it dropping eight feet, feet to the ground outside. And you get that up in the window, and then once it's there, you have to guard it so they can't eat it. And then you have to guard the cord so they can't get to that. So a project like that, most people could probably do an air conditioner change in a... In a in an hour. It took five. Because not only do you have to measure it and cut the wood and get the, the air conditioner up there, but you also have to get a face on it. So I had to put a cage over it that they they couldn't eat the front of the, the air conditioner. 
and it wouldn't take long for them to destroy it. You guys be good up there. Sugar, you be nice. So, you have to protect the plug in the wall, you have to protect the cord all the way up to the unit, and the unit itself. So I put a little video in showing you how I did that. And then of course, this also, I had to take out that huge cave that went around the air conditioner. So, the other thing is, once you've got the air conditioner in the window, you're more or less committed. <coughs> because either you can't have birds in the room, and Chloe would go nuts if she couldn't be in her room. Hey, hey, hey. Here. Chew the wood. Chew the wood, okay? That's odd. He hasn't really been nippy at all, and now I get the cameras in here, and all of a sudden he's getting nippy again. I know it's mating season. I know that. I know it. I know it. So you have things like that. Once you're committed, once it's in the wall, once it's up there, and you won't be able to get birds in the room unless you fix it. So you have those projects that have to be done in one shot. So that was one of them. Then there's other projects that you can do over days. And, and a good example is like I'm dealing with him being nippy right now and because of mating season. So I'm actually dealing with the mating season, behavioral issues like that. It's a day-by-day -day project. Bob, I don't want you eating the couch. Come here. So it's a day-by-day -day project. You need to get off my feet because you're going to eat them. I know you. There you go. You be calm. Here. You done with the stick? Are you done with the stick? Are you? Cecil, you got that, you got that dull look in your eyes again. Hello? Are you in there? Cecil. Hey, you. Hey. Come on, let's do something with the Cecil. He Cecil the cockatoo, hello. He Cecil the cockatoo, hello. He's strong to the finish, cause he eats his spinach. He's Cecil the cockatoo. Right, Cecil? Right, Cecil boy? Hey, Cecil. He Cecil the cockatoo. He Cecil the cockatoo. He's strong to the finish cause he eats his spinach. He's Cecil. It's not funny, Bob. Get over here. Leave her alone. That's my boy. Now if you get down there, that sets Bob off. He's already in the mood. He's already in the mood. If you get down there, it sets him off. Why don't you play over here? I'll give you a piece of wood here. I don't know about chewing a feather, but... It gets your attention for a while. What's up, sugar? So you have projects that you're going to do over a period of time and ones that have to be done no matter what. So you have to plan what happens if I get stuck on this project. And it takes, I planned the project for, for three and a half hours. That's what I figured. It, tended up, it ended up being five when I was doing the air conditioner. So I have certain set basic plans for situations. If I don't have enough time to both feed them wet food for dinner, because they've got dry food out, right? If I don't have time to feed them wet food for dinner and have them out to play, then I take them out to play. Because they need the playtime more than they need the wet food. So you have to decide what the priority is. Now, I made that decision over time, watching how they reacted to situations. So you decide situations that for some reason you get caught up and you don't get back in time to, to feed them and take them out, then in, as long as they've had food all day, dry food, or you can put dry food in their cage at night so they can much before they go to sleep, then, then in that case I've cho chosen not to worry about that. So, so you need contingency plans. Uh, look with her. What do I do if... I can't get her out during the day because she's just attacking everybody. And it's just territoriality with her, and she's not really going to hurt anybody. She's like most umbrella cockatoos, 
and she's not violent. She doesn't really want to hurt anyone, but she wants to chase him away from her territory. She's just so pushy about it that the other birds get scared and they bite her. So the only one that gets hurt is her. So my contingency plan with her, if she's in a day where she's not doing well with other birds, and you, know, you have her out for two minutes and she's flying into everybody, what I do is I take her out with me while I'm working on doing my computer work, and she's, she's good. She sits on me, there can be other birds in the room, there's no problem. While she's sitting on me, she does fine. So my contingency plan with her is if she does not get the time out during the day because she is being aggressive with other birds, and right now I can't take her out because he's being territorial. Partially because she's in the room. Nine times out of the ten, he's in a different rotation. She's not out when he's out. And that's a darn good thing to do, too. So the contingency plans that you have to do are like that. When he's out, she's not out. If, for some reason, she has to be out like she is right now, and he's out at the same time, there has to be plenty of things that you can get him interested in. And you have to try to keep his, something in his beak. Because you know, they, they want to be a mated pair, and they're going to keep trying. So, when I had decided to, get a, uh, to, to go into having a sanctuary, and forming a, an organization, the first thing I did was you know, sit down and think about what's the best way to approach it. Then I sought out um, professional help from an organization called SCORE, which is uh, retired people who were in business who understand how to do things and they teach classes. It's a nonprofit, so I went there and and I also studied a book from Nolo Press on how to form a nonprofit in California. They have one through the rest of the country, and California has their own. And with all that information, I then went about doing it. You get consultation with experts to see how to approach something, and then you come up with your own plans based on that. And one of the things I knew I was going to need was some expertise in handling birds and understanding their behavior. So what I did then was go around and you know, I, I searched on the web to try to find professionals in the field who taught how to deal with birds from a scientific viewpoint. If you want to work consistently with birds, then you need, need to understand the science of behavior. So I, that's how I found Dr. Friedman and I took her classes and then I took classes in biology and then, of course, I went on to study on my own. I found, through my mentors, I found the best texts that deal with veterinary science, you know, the Basada Manual for Citizen Birds and the Clinical Avian Medicine. And then I found the best texts on behavior, which is Learning and Behavior by Paul Chance, which is the generalized field of applied behavior analysis. And then, then the Manual of Parrot Behavior by Lucier, a summary of what we know about behavior. So that's how I armed myself there. So you want to research what you're going to do and find out, get as much expert help as you can deciding how you're going to approach it. Then learn what you need to learn and design a plan. So that's basically what I do on a daily basis with these guys. So another crisis, another crisis I ran into, and this is not, you know, like life-threatening crisis, but we were spending a ton of money on toys, so I had to try to examine ways to approach this where we could save money. And uh, looking at the components, what it takes to make toys, I went out and first thing I did was research what do toy parts cost? How much does it cost for, for chain? What different kinds of uh, chain are there? There's nickel plated, there's stainless steel. Um, you know, is nickel, had to determine whether nickel plated, which is considerably less than stainless steel, if that's safe. And you know, birds don't generally chew the chain, even if they could get the coating off of the chain, it, you know, they don't generally do that. But anyway, I had to determine those things and then sit down and figure out the dollar value. If you think it's going to be a really long and arduous project and there's a lot of things to do, just break it into small parts. Say, okay, I'm gonna you know, look for the next week, I'm gonna look online and see what kind of parts are available. 
you know, what, what the cost is, how much you have to buy at one time. And then you start looking into, well, wood, what kind of woods are available. And one of the things I did in that research was find out that um, they're using just whatever wood is available on the market. Because if they were using something special, they'd be boasting about it. Also, a lot of the wood and these toys are coming from places like the Philippines or, uh, you know, or China, so are somewhat questionable. So then I sat down and you know, you sat down and calculate how much is it going to cost. And when I first calculated, I couldn't believe it. It's like it's going to cost a dollar fifty or two dollars to make a toy. Uh, so I had to calculate: are these toy are these going to be reusable? I knew that a lot of the parts for the toys that I had bought in the past. So the crisis of having to spend three hundred dollars a month on toys, you know, dropped down to less than thirty or you know, twenty dollars. We have a whole episode on making toys, but. Again, if you if you have that, it's actually a crisis. You're you can't afford to spend four thousand dollars a year on toys with twelve birds. So how are you going to get the cost down? And it's the same way with with food. These are little crises, but how do you provide excellent food for them every day that has the elements they need in it, um, and do that without spending a ton of money? So come on, cutie. Come on. Come on. Someone's coming over here. Bob, she's coming over to me here. It's all right, sweetheart. Hey, sugar, sugar. Hey, sugar. That's my sugar girl. She wants to be over here with us. Yes, she does. That's our sugar girl. I know, Peaches, that's your rival. I know, but you know I love you. With Cecil, I ran into the situation where he can just bust his way out of cages. Most cages are put together, they're tacked together. It's a tack weld. It's just a tiny little spot between each bar. Well, he pops those apart like there's nothing to them. Like they're not even there. He breaks them apart. So a bead weld where there's actually a lot of material put around in that where the two pieces of metal come together, there's a, a nice chunk of welded material in between. So, and it looks like a bead. I've only seen him break one of those, and I found an older cage, which had bead welds, and the, but they weren't that great, and he broke through that cage. That one's sitting outside. Actually, I had to put wood across the back, and nice flight, Chloe. Well controlled. There she goes. And you know, then it was a matter of just hold, trying to hold the cage together because I had nothing else. Eventually, we had a cage donated. It was an older cage donated to us that it's bead welded. That he he hasn't torn it apart yet. So until I could find the cage, I had to have some way to keep him in a cage. So I, you know, I took, uh, it's called plumber's tape, it's, it's metal tape with holes in it that you use a hang pipe and that kind of thing. So I took that and ran it around and then put bolts in it to hold those bars in place because he'd break the bars off and then toss them off the cage. So I did that and then I put wood behind it and bolted that through and, you know, and then eventually another cage came along. And then on top of that, I go in and there's food everywhere. He's taking the wet food and throwing it all over the place, the, the cups out of there, so. Then I had to look. Yeah, Bob, are you imitating me? You are? I thought you were. So, and then I had to think about it. I came up with C-clamps. And you put a C-clamp down and you, you cinch it on there so it goes, the, the the bowl goes in, the C-clamp goes over and catches the rim underneath, and you clamp it down, and that keeps him from throwing the bowls out. That doesn't keep him from bending the arm of the C-clamp around and jamming it under the, the uh, wires on the cage so that you have a heck of a time getting it out. He'll do that sometimes. It's almost as if he knows that if he jams it under there just right that it's almost impossible to get out. So there are a lot of things. Uh, 
the birds tend to do their droppings all in the same spots, and you know this this is a problem. But I mean, it's not as bad a problem as animals that wouldn't would do it at any old place. They have their spots, and they like to go there. So I put carpets out to catch it in those spots, and paper. Sometimes the paper gets moved. So, uh, you know, you, you, you come up with ideas, and then you, I took a, um, <laughs> it's not that funny, Bob. I took a, all right, come on out. Well, go on. Well, come on, sweetheart, come on. So I took a paint scraper, just one of those little <laughs> knives you use to, to, you know, to put in uh, a spackle or to, put, to spray paint off or something. I took one of those and I just bent the end down at a 45 and then I taped it on the end of a stick. So, and it really works well if you know, the poop's been sitting there for just a couple of minutes and it's congealed a little bit, you just reach down with the stick and take it right up. Then you can go back later that night because you've got all the wet, most of the wet stuff up. I mean, it's, you just have a little spot you have to clean. You can come back later after they're in, in their cages and you can just clean it up by spraying it with some poop off and, and cleaning it out. So, oh, you want to get petted? Bob, I can't pet her if I'm holding you. So you want to get down there? Okay, hi, sweetie. How are you doing? Hey, sugar. Hey, sugar. <laughs> So if, the other thing too is, you know, uh, crisis management. When you look at electrical cords, uh, you can hide most of them or put them in other rooms or not have cords in the room they're in. But um, what I found is if you have exposed electrical cords, um, one of the best things to do is to take metal cord, this metal corrugated uh, tubing. It's normally put over electrical cords. If you look at a lot of appliances have it, they have a cord running through this flexible aluminum casing. So what you do is you get some of that and you can get it at Home Depot and cut it up. Again, this was, you know, wow, I got these cords, what am I gonna do? So um, you cut the end off of the electrical cord and then you run it through, which you can do with string. You can just get string through it and then pull the cord through. And then you put an end on the other end of the cord and then I take some um, wire baskets. Basically, it's a wire basket. And you have the cord go through the wire basket. You put the wire basket on the wall, and that plugs into the wall. And it could easily be a crisis if you have an electrical cord lying out where these guys can get it. Now, behavioral issues, too. I mean, you're going to have crisis there. So you have to know, and it's best to plan ahead what you're going to do when it happens. Instead of saying, oh my word, this just happened, say, oh well, that happened now. Here's what I had planned for that. So with him, what I normally do is what you saw. I pick up something and put it in his beak. That, that's my plan. Um, if they have something like that in their beak, they can't bite. So other things are um, divert them with toys. Uh, put them in a different environment. A lot of different things you could do, but come up with some kind of a plan for that so you're ready when it happens. Because in most cases, with most birds, it's going to happen at some point. You get a lot of misinformation from people who haven't bothered to read what the experts have to say. You know, the experts have found out that the parents teach their, teach their babies their names, and they learn the names of the other birds in the flock, and they communicate using names. Um, so you want to look. You want to look at experts, and that, and you don't want to. Now, an expert is not an authority. The difference between an authority and an expert is, when you hear what an authority says, it's, you know, that's it, and there's no thinking about it. The authority says this. An expert simply they have a specific knowledge of the subject, and it gives a lot of weight to what they say. Um, whereas somebody who's lived with birds for 20 years, that. It doesn't give them a lot of weight to what they say if they haven't looked at, they haven't studied the physiology and the psychology. They've just lived with them and formed their own opinions. The odds are a lot of what they say just won't be true. Again, the idea that birds have dominance, they don't. Parrots do not have any dominance. There's no hierarchical relationship between peaches and Bob and sugar. Sugar bird. And um, 
salamander. There is no such thing with them. And there isn't in the wild. So, so you're going to have behavioral issues that are going to come up and you have to know where you're going to refer to and have a general plan in hand. And you want to have good choices that you've vetted through people who know what they're talking about, through experts. That can be through textbooks on the subjects of behavior. It can be through experts such as uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Pepperberg or Dr. Friedman. And then establish a plan. This is how I'm going to deal with it. And if you need to change it, you know, I'll alter it a little bit here or there because of the situation. Uh, that's no big deal. Having a plan gives you a basis to work from, and then you bend and twist it to fit the circumstances that come up. Here goes my hearing, little girl. You yell in my ear. It's ringing. You're making my ear ring. Yeah. I can't wear that earring. I can hear it, but I can't wear it. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing up there, Shug Shug? When you're doing things that center around your birds, you want to make sure that they're going to be able to accept whatever changes you're making without too much of a problem. You can't be 100% sure. I wouldn't have guessed that Rumford baking powder would send Chloe into another, onto another planet screaming. Safety is a big consideration. And you have to try to think of how they can approach something where they might get into something that wouldn't be safe such as even bringing avocados into the house, you have to make sure that whatever cabinet you put those in, they can't get to them um, because they're poisonous to parrots, just as rhubarb is and some other things. So, And will whatever addition you're putting into the environment, is that going to enrich their lives? A good example is if you've got, if they're in a room that's kind of cold, and you have a HEPA filter blowing on them, or you've got them sleeping at night with a HEPA filter blowing directly on them, it's not a good idea to have air just blowing at them. What we did with HEPA filters is I built, I got wire mesh, and I built, I have a HEPA filter in the, the main bird room, it's a tall HEPA filter, so I built a, took a, some wire mesh and made a round tube to go around it, and then I made uh, a mesh over the, put some of the mesh over the top, and then I cut a section out for the cord to go through. And then the cord has that metal corrugated um, piece over the wire itself, right? And then it goes to the wall with the cage made from the, uh, the wire basket. So the safety part was all that so that they can't get to it, so they can't possibly electrocute themselves and start a fire. And the HEPA filters in the room because they, we need to get the dust out of the air. Those cockatoos are really dusty, so... The, dusty, the dust isn't good for them to breathe either. In the wild, that's washed away by the rain and the air moving. But in this environment, they have to breathe their own cockatoo dust. And that's not good for them either, so... So you need to think about enrichment, about acceptance and safety for every little crisis you're dealing with and every situation. And the, the last issue, the, as far as, as dealing with the what ifs, is you need, and I learned this from Fran Cannon at Cannon Training in San Diego. I believe he's out of Riverside now, but I had asked him about what to do in a situation of starting a nonprofit. Again, talk to every mentor you possibly can. He's a, he's a great business advisor and an mentor. So I asked him, you know, what is the key thing when you're starting a nonprofit? And he said, have as many credit cards as you possibly can. Try not to use them, but have them there. Keep them active. You know, buy, if you have to buy your groceries on it and pay it off every month just to keep it active because you never know when you're going to need them. You may have the peaches when I had to take her in because she had impacted feathers in her tail. Um, Actually having the hemostats available to pull the feather, having the super clot there to, to stop the extra bleeding because she had a problem with her follicles, having a vet in place to go to, you know, already knowing which vets I could take her to, and, and uh, Dr. Jenkins is our primary, but Dr. Lutless and Dr. Young uh, are there too if we need them. So. 
it was one, two, three. Take the hemostat, pull it out, get the super clot on it, make an appointment, get her down there immediately. So you're in a situation like that, you gotta have the money in the bank. Uh, other crisis, which I almost failed to mention, is, is just having to pull a blood feather. When they get blood, they have a feather, some feathers come in with blood that goes almost all the way down the feather. If that feather starts bleeding, um, they're, they have a lot of pressure behind the, the, the blood flow. So they're gonna bleed out. If they break the feather, they are going to bleed out. I have pictures, I'll see if I can find one. I hate to put it in the video because it's not pleasant to look at. But she was actually washed off in the picture, but Sugar had, she had broken a feather and she was covered in blood. And after I had washed her off, obviously I, taking a video of her was not the most important thing, or a picture was saving her life. But once I got her cleaned up and the blood, it wasn't, you know, oozing out anymore. I took a picture. Immediately, hemostats, you know, and you, you pull slowly, you don't yank, because you don't want to damage the follicle, but you pull slowly <clears throat> and pull the feather out. Well, when I did that, her follicles were not normal, so it left part of the feather in the follicle. It was nasty. So I got the super clot on it, got the bleeding stopped, got her down to Dr. Young, and we had to pull a ton of feathers that day. Didn't we, baby? Didn't we? <laughs> But you need to know how to pull the blood feather. And that's, you get it right above where the, you'll see where there's a little piece that comes out of the skin. It's got keratin, you know, that has like a nail material on it. And the feather's coming out right there. You need to get just above where it actually attaches to the skin and just pull slowly until it comes out. Slow, even pressure. And the hemostats are the way to do it. Uh, I know that needle nose will work sometimes, but you're trying to hold pressure on the needle nose and pull at the same time. It's, it's ineffective. It's unprofessional and in, ineffective. Uh, that's why people who use flour to try to stop bleeding. It's, and as Dr. Um, Burkett on the East Coast says, don't bring me a birdie biscuit. You know, these are not biscuits. These are birds. You want to use the right tools. So super costly stuff for that. So when you run into a crisis like a blood feather, you want to be ready for it. You want to have practiced. You don't have to pull a feather, but you want to practice the idea. You want to hold the bird. You want to flip their feathers out. And you want to put the take the hemostat up there and get it in the right position. Don't lock it down. Just kind of get it in the right position so that you know you can do that. If you're single, you should practice it like you're single anyway, because you may have that when nobody else is in the house. And then you can practice it with someone else, too. So someone else holding the bird who's normally around um, in that situation. And um, both of you should practice it. Actually, everyone who can should learn how to do that because it is life-threatening. It doesn't take very long. 20 minutes, half hour for a bird to die from blood loss. They don't have anywhere uh, as much blood as we do, even based on their size. You know, if you were to take us down to their size, we have a lot more blood than they do, so... Injuries, if, uh, you know, of once in a while something will get, a, get out of hand and somebody will get bit, you should have something to clean the wound. And for cleaning wounds, your best thing would be using uh, hydrogen peroxide just to clean the wound. It's not going to disinfect, actually, but it will help you clean it. It will get the blood out of there, and you can use it on the feathers, too. Um, see what you've got as a situation. If you have any doubts of, about the severity of a bite, or um, if they hurt themselves in some way and they're bleeding, you get the bleeding stopped, and then get them to a vet as soon as you can. If the bleeding doesn't stop, you've got to get them to a vet right away. Now, if there's no vet who has a 24-hour service and you need to get that bleeding stopped, um, having that super clot on hand is, is gonna work, and unless it's you know, strong arterial blood, which you can't stop, you can also do a compress on it, just like you would with your own skin. You just press against it. Put some super clot on it, press against it for you know, like 10 minutes, just gently against it, and that should stop the bleeding. Right? Um, if you're in a situation where, let's say you've left the house for a while, but you have a window open, and then there's a fire, and there's smoke gets in the house, you want to get them into a room with a HEPA filter, 
and just, you know, get that room as clean as smoke as possible. Or if you can, if it's, if it's bad, you want to get them out of there. So if it's possible to get them into an air-conditioned vehicle where you know, the smoke is not going to be in it and get them out of there, that's great. If not, you've got to get them in a room with a couple of HEPA filters running full blast and get that smoke out of there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I hear you, sweetie. Are you crying? I'm not paying you enough? I'm sorry. And those last words on uh, dealing with crisis, um, just have a plan for any contingency, whatever may happen. What did you bite me for? I have a plan, he says. I won't take it personally, he says. All the time I spend feeding you, playing with you, cleaning your cage. Guilt, that's my plan. When he stops talking, the papaya will come walking. What situations are going to come up when you're going to take them directly to the vet? There, there's an excellent DVD, by the way, from, um, you can get from the Bernie Boutique. Um, Dr. Burkett has a, a first aid DVD that's excellent. Um, he actually defines those situations that are first aid treatable and those that are first aid literally, and then you go to the vet. And he does it well, and he's not pushing veterinary services. He's quite clear. And he's also kind of fun to watch, so. But have a plan. Know what you're going to do. Um, stick to the things we know are, are valid. You know, medical science. Remember what, the, what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to actually work. Medical techniques have used the Red Cross to, find, to help you define what your exit strategies are in a disaster. Have your little bags ready to go for your birds so that you can take off and have everything. If you've got a lot of birds, you may want to have a medical bag and then a, a bag with food and toys and everything for every one of your birds. And a place to go so you know where to go. And you should have alternates. If someone's out of town, you want to still have a place you can go. A little bit of money in the bank and some credit cards to cover any emergencies. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where, like with her, when she was bleeding out and I had to take her to the vet if I didn't have a credit card to pay. And if you don't have some way to pay it, then you've, you've really put them at, at risk and you don't want to do that. Because you love your birds, right? Don't we, Peach? Don't we, Sugar? Bob, are you still talking? Okay. You talking? Mm, you talking? You talking? I want to encourage everyone to become a patron and go out to patreon.com forward slash Chloe Sanctuary. And you can give as little as a dollar an episode, just a dollar an episode to help us do this. Takes about 30 hours to do one video, and we would appreciate your help. And thank you so much to all of our patrons who are helping us now. You guys are wonderful. Peaches, you want to say goodbye to all the people? Peaches, you want to say goodbye to all the people? Peaches, say goodbye to the people. Oh, Peaches. Thank you so much for watching Cockatude, episode 26. What if? We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower.